All praise is due to Allah. He forgives sins. He accepts repentance. His punishment is severe and his bounty is limitless. None deserves worship except him and to him alone will be the final return of all. I praise Allah as he is perfect in every way. I am grateful to him. I repent to him and I ask his forgiveness. I testify that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone without any partner. He has complete knowledge of everything, even the most minute of details. He knows all secrets as well as the intentions that all people have. To him alone all wholesome words ascend and righteous deeds are raised and he is able to do all things. I further testify that Muhammad is Allah's worshipping servant and chosen messenger whom Allah granted a degree of love greater than other people. That messenger left us upon a path so clear that its night is as bright as its day and no one strays from it except an individual who leads himself to his own demise. May my Lord grant commendation and protection to his messenger as well as to the messenger's immaculate family, esteemed companions, and all who continue following their path until the day of recompense. Dear people of Iman, Observe taqwa of Allah as He rightfully deserves by fulfilling His commands and avoiding His prohibitions. And make your deeds righteous by emulating your Prophet and sincerely devoting all your deeds to Allah. If someone hopes to meet his Lord, he must perform righteous deeds and he must not worship anything whatsoever along with Allah. Dear Ummah of Islam, during the month of Rajab, in the ninth year after Hijra, the Prophet, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, traveled to the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula and spent 50 days in very adverse conditions. 30 days were spent traveling and 20 days were spent at the location known as Tabuk. He returned from there to Al-Medina during the blessed month of Ramadan and he was over 60 years old at the time. That was the expedition to Tabuk. The expedition to Tabuk, which the Qur'an referred to as a time of difficulty due to the difficulties that existed from all perspectives. Jabir, may Allah be pleased with him, had remarked that they had faced difficulties regarding mounts, provisions, and water all at the same time. Ibn Hibban collected the report with an authentic chain of narration from Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, which mentions that someone had said to him, we would like you to narrate something to us about the time of difficulty. Umar replied, we set out to Tabuk during very intense heat. At some point we stopped at a place due to being so thirsty that we thought our throats would tear. The difficulty faced was so great that if a man among us sacrificed his camel, he would squeeze any liquid out of food left in its digestive tract, drink it, and put the remainder over the area of his liver. Thus, their path was a long one, their provisions were scarce, and the heat was severe. At the same time, in Al Medina, the fruits were ripe and shade was readily available. People's souls were quite content to remain there and not set out at such a time, except for those who gave pleasing Allah priority over enjoyment of this world and gave preference to remaining in the company of the Prophet, may Allah grant him commendation and protection. 30,000 individuals set out with Allah's Messenger, may Allah grant him commendation and protection. And those who were excused by Allah and His Messenger stayed back since Allah had absolved them of any sin for doing so and he granted them the rank of those who participated in the expedition due to his knowledge about the genuineness of their intentions even as they remained in the safety of their own homes. Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that when Allah's Messenger, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, neared al Medina while returning from Tabuk, he remarked, There are certainly groups of people in al Medina who most surely remain with you along every path you had tread and every valley you had traversed. Another narration contains the wording, who most surely shared with you in being rewarded by Allah. The companions present inquired, Messenger of Allah, that is the case even though they remained in Al-Medina? He replied, yes, even though they remained in Al-Medina, they were kept back by legitimate excuses. 
My dear brothers who have Iman, intentions are of utmost importance. They come at the head of all virtues and they are the foundation of all actions. When a person has the firm resolve to do something good, he will follow through in doing it. And when he has a genuine intention to reach an objective, he will eventually reach it. This is why our righteous Salaf placed much emphasis on having sound intentions. Sufyan Athari had said, Those who preceded us learned to have intentions for performing deeds, just as you learn how to perform deeds. Thus, when the intention behind a deed is pure, the deed itself will also be pure. A deed that might seem minuscule can become enormous due to the intention behind it. Similarly, a deed that might seem enormous can become minuscule due to the intention behind it. Furthermore, a genuine intention may enable a person to be admitted to Jannah even if he did not perform the deeds of its people. A hadith in Sahih Muslim mentions that a man from Bani Israel had killed 100 people but he then sought to repent and in doing so, he left his town and was on his way to another one which had righteous individuals. While traveling there, he died. And Allah accepted his repentance and rewarded him due to the soundness of his attention. In addition, among the companions, there was an individual named Amr ibn Thabit. He had initially rejected Islam. But on the day when the Battle of Uhud took place, he made the decision to accept Islam. Afterwards, he took his sword, set out to the battlegrounds, entered among the people, fought until he was incapacitated due to injuries, and eventually passed away. Other companions mentioned that to Allah's Messenger, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, who said in response, He is most certainly among the people of Jannah. This is collected by Ahmed with an authentic chain of narration. Hence, that companion was admitted to Jannah because of the testimony of Tawheed as well as having the firm resolve to maintain sound beliefs and perform righteous deeds. That happened even though he had not prostrated to Allah even once. This makes it clear that when Allah knows that a servant of His has sound intentions and a pure heart, Allah makes that person's words correct, makes his deeds bring about much benefit, and rewards him for the efforts he expends. Intending to do good things enables a person to reach ranks beyond those attained by way of his deeds alone, and he is rewarded for what he intends. A hadith in Sunan and Nasa'i mentions that the Prophet, may Allah grant him commendation or protection, said, If a person goes to his bed intending to get up and pray at night, but his two eyes overcome him until the morning, the reward for what he intended would still be recorded and his sleep would be charity granted to him by his Lord, the Almighty and Most Majestic. Additionally, the Quran tells us that if anyone leaves his home migrating to Allah and his messenger, but is overtaken by death before reaching his destination, Allah would still undoubtedly reward him. Ibn Kathir, may Allah have mercy upon him, explained that this means if a person leaves his home intending that migration, but dies while still on his way, he would still attain from Allah the reward of someone who had actually migrated. Dear people of Iman, another one of the blessings of a sound intention is that one's deed would be accepted even if particular results did not ensue from it. A hadith in the two Sahih collections mentions that the Prophet, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, had said, that a man among peoples prior to us had discreetly given charity to a few people. However, unbeknown to him, the first person was an adulteress, the second was a wealthy man, and the third was a thief. While the man who gave charity was asleep, someone told him in a dream, as for your charity, it was accepted. As for the adulteress, perhaps you will refrain from her adultery. Perhaps the wealthy man will take heed and then give from what Allah has bestowed upon him. And perhaps the thief will refrain from his theft. Ibn Hajar, may Allah mercy upon him, commented regarding this hadith that if a person has a righteous intention when he gives charity, his charity will be accepted even if it does not end up with an entitled recipient. In addition, by maintaining a righteous intention, a person of Iman would attain rewards for his mundane activities and as he goes about earning his livelihood. As a result of maintaining that intention, customary acts would turn into acts of worship. And this is a very important way to increase one's righteous deeds, which many people are heedless about. A hadith in the two Sahih collections mentions that Allah's Messenger, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, said, There is no amount that you give while seeking Allah's face, for which you would not be rewarded.
even for a morsel of food you put in your wife's mouth. Al Imam No, we may love mercy upon him, commented that in general, when a man puts a bite of food in his wife's mouth, it would likely be at a time of being playful, light-hearted, and taking delight in doing something permissible. That would be the farthest of times from focusing on acts of obedience to Allah and matters of the hereafter. Despite that, the Prophet, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, said that if a man feeds his wife a morsel while seeking the face of Allah, the most exalted, the person he would be rewarded for doing so. This concept was something the companions understood well. Mu'adh, may Allah be pleased with him, had said, I most certainly hope to attain Allah's reward for sleeping, just as I do for standing in prayer. In other words, even though sleep involves being at rest, he hoped to be rewarded for that just as he did for being awake and engaged in prayer. Thus, to anyone who has to remain stationary due to illness, who missed the chance to perform righteous deeds due to traveling, or whom Allah knows has a legitimate excuse, I say the following. If Allah wills, the reward written in the record of your deeds will be for each righteous deed you had performed while healthy and active. A hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari mentions that Allah's Messenger, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, said, If a servant of Allah becomes ill or travels, he will still have recorded for him what he used to do while in his homeland and while healthy. A righteous intention is the best thing with which a person can begin and conclude his day, and it is the best thing he can store away for himself. Therefore, it would only be fitting for a person of Iman to intend to say and do good things. That way, even if he does not live to carry out what he intended, or is obstructed from carrying it out, his reward would still be recorded by Allah. Abdullah, the son of Imam Ahmed, had said to his father one day, My dear father, I would like you to impart some advice to me. His father replied, My dear young son, intend to do what is good. You will continue to remain in a good state so long as you intend to do what is good. Allah said there is no good in much of what people discuss privately unless they encourage each other to give in charity, perform righteous deeds in general, or reconcile between people. If a person does those hoping to please Allah, we, Allah, will grant him a magnificent reward. May Allah bless us all by the Qur'an and Sunnah, and may He allow us to glean benefit from the evidences and wisdom they contain. I say this much, and I ask Allah to forgive myself as well as all of you. Thus, you should also ask His forgiveness, since He is the continually forgiving, the bestower of mercy. All praise is due to Allah, who sent His Messenger with guidance and the religion of truth in order to make that prevail over all other religions. And Allah is sufficient as a witness. I testify that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone, without any partner. And I testify that Muhammad is Allah's worshipping servant and messenger. May Allah grant an abundance of commendation, protection and blessings to his messenger as well as to the messenger's family and companions. Dear people of Iman, there is no doubt that Hajj is a foundational pillar of Islam. Allah the Most Exalted made it obligatory for His worshipping servants to perform Hajj if they have the ability to do so. However, due to the ongoing pandemic, bringing about the greatest good lies in limiting the number of people who will perform Hajj this year in order to protect people's lives. There is no doubt that one of the most crucial foundations of Islam's teachings is preserving life which is one of five indispensable necessities that Islam instructs us to protect and not expose to danger or harm. Thus, we pray that Allah rewards the custodian of the two holy mosques as well as his deputy for the care and attention they give to issues concerning the people of Islam. In addition, among the things which Allah provided as a substitute to those unable to perform Hajj is that He granted them the first ten days of the Hijjah, if a person is prevented from performing the rites of Hajj, Allah would reward him according to his intention. And Allah has also provided him with the opportunity during these 10 days to perform numerous acts of worship even while he is in his own homeland and home. Among the deeds prescribed is fasting during these days, especially on the day of Arafah, since fasting it is a means to expiation for two years of sins. A hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood mentions that some of the wives of the Prophet 
May Allah grant him commendation and protection, had said that Allah's Messenger, May Allah grant him commendation and protection, used to fast the first nine days of the Hijjah. Dhikr, mentioning Allah by saying prescribed words of glorification, also holds higher rank in these first ten days of the Hijjah than at other times. There's a hadith in Musnad al-Imam Ahmad in which it was said that the Prophet, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, stated, there are no days more magnificent to Allah and in which righteous deeds are more beloved to him than these ten days. Therefore, strive often during them to say, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, and Alhamdulillah. Therefore, dear people of Iman, prepare yourselves adequately for these days. Give them the reverence that was prescribed by Allah. Perform many acts of obedience throughout them and strive to be foremost in performing righteous deeds. These days are the most magnificent days there are in this world. A hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari mentions that the Prophet, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, said, No righteous deeds are more virtuous than the ones performed during these days, referring to the first ten of the Hijjah. The companions present asked, Not even jihad? struggling in Allah's path to uphold the religion that he prescribed? He replied, not even jihad, except in the case of a man who endangers his own life and property in order to overcome the enemy and does not return with any of those things. Ibn Rajab, may Allah have mercy upon him, commented that the most accurate view, as mentioned by a number of relatively late scholars, is that the collective of these first ten of Dhul Hijjah as a whole is more virtuous than the collective of the last ten of Ramadan, even though those contain one night that is more virtuous than all others. In conclusion, remember the instruction the law gave us when he said, Indeed, Allah grants his commendation to the Prophet and the angels invoke Allah to grant him even further commendation. People of Iman invoke Allah to grant the Prophet commendation and to grant him protection as well. O oh Allah, Grant your commendation and protection to your Prophet Muhammad, his wives, and his descendants. O oh Allah, we implore you to grant strength to Islam and the people of Islam. O oh Allah, we beseech you to rectify the conditions of the people of Islam in all places. O oh Allah, relieve the distress of those who are afflicted and grant care to our ailing and all the ill among the people of Islam. O oh Allah, most majestic, owner of all favor, ever living, self-sufficient, sustainer of all. O oh Allah, we implore you to preserve the custodian of the two holy mosques. Grant him protection that can only come from you. O oh Allah, grant him your care and you are the best from whom we can seek protection. O oh Allah, we implore you to grant our leader health and well-being. O oh Allah, grant him as well as his deputy your guidance and direction to all that would bring about what is best for Islam and the people who submit to you in Islam. O oh Allah, we beseech you for your bounty and your favor. O oh Allah, we beseech you to protect us and to direct us so that we perform righteous deeds during these first ten days of the Hijjah. O oh Allah, we beseech you to avert from us all forms of adversity, all ailments, all illnesses, and all harms. O oh Allah, we seek refuge with you against any harm or ill that may be decreed. O oh Allah, we beseech you to grant care and cure to our ailing. O oh Allah, grant well-being to those who have been tested. O oh Allah, we ask this of you, as you are the most merciful of all who can show mercy. O oh Allah, none has the right to be worshipped except you. We have indeed been among those who perpetrate tremendous wrongdoing. Our Lord, grant us good in this world, grant us good in the hereafter, and save us from the torment of the hellfire. Our Lord, grant us good in this world, grant us good in the hereafter, and protect us from the torment of the hellfire. Our Lord is perfect in every way, absolved above all the wrong ascribed to Him. He grants protection to all of His messengers, and all praise is due to Allah, the Lord 
of all creation.